nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Good morning, Leavenworth citizens. Um, today is May 13th, 2020, and welcome to the Mayor's Facebook Live Town Hall. Um, believe it or not, this is the ninth iteration of this uh, Town Hall. Um, I'm not sure that time is going by quickly, but uh, we started, started these Town Halls a um, little over two months ago. And um, we continue, because there is still uh, a great deal of important information to share with uh, the citizens within our city. Um, Mr. Kramer, the city manager is here with me as he has been on the previous, all previous face, Facebook Live town halls. And we're very fortunate today to have my guest expert, Mr. Jake Potter. He's the Director of Public Relations and Outreach Services for the Leavenworth School District, USD 453. As part of the district's administrative team, Jake has been a part of the planning and rollout of the district's virtual learning program and has been involved in graduation plans for the class of 2020. And if you have questions for Mr. Potter, uh, please submit them during, during our Facebook Live Town Hall. And um, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Jake and thank him for coming and talking to the public today. Absolutely, thank right. you for being here. Right. Um, as you mentioned, it is a busy time of year. Um, this is a busy time of year during the traditional season as we do lots of celebrations as each grade level is promoted, specifically the, the senior class this year, 2020. So I would like to run through just a few things that we've been up to. Um, and as we begin to close out this school year and then also look ahead to next, as you men mentioned, all Kansas school districts learned right at the beginning of spring break that in-person instruction would cease for the remainder of the school year quickly pivoting all of us into the design and launch of something that had never been done before under these unprecedented times, which was coming up with a way to provide connections with our students and what was called a continuous learning plan. So we've been at that for the last eight weeks. We've been able to make some inline adjustments as we moved on, um, but basically persevered through the end of this school year. Um, so how the end of this school year looks is basically all new instruction and assignments the last day of that is this Friday, um, which is a little bit earlier than typically the last day of our school would have been a half day on the 22nd. And one of the non-traditional things are all of our students that have devices or have reason to come back to the school for any reason, we need a little bit more of a buffer to handle those in-person, um, basically check-ins, check-outs, while also being mindful of social distancing guidelines. So all of those kinds of activities will take place next week. Um, we're also trying to still, while we have the momentum of this year being fresh, have as many conversations as we can with our building administrators and our teaching staff to figure out our best practices from the last eight, eight weeks, replicable successes and opportunities for improvements because I think we're all in the same boat knowing that there is a very distinct possibility we could find ourselves in a similar condition, maybe not the first day of school next year, but at some point during the fall, winter, for a second semester. So we want to make sure that we, if there are things that we could do better, and there always are, um, that we're taking this opportunity while, while some of those last days of school are still fresh. So those kinds of activities are scheduled to take place next week. Um, some of those will give us more flexibility if and when the Lovemore County Public, Public Health Department and or State of Kansas advances us to phase two as we're then allowed gatherings up to 30 individuals in a confined space. We're able to maintain six foot social distancing. All of our activities and we have a number of employees that have been continuing to report on a daily basis be that facilities, custodial, child nutrition, technology. We've been very mindful of CDC guidelines and will continue to do so as we bring in more bodies into our, to our buildings. Um, speaking specifically about the class of 2020, um, that's been one of our most special populations during the course of the last, last uh, eight weeks, knowing that they missed out on a lot of traditional milestones and events um, that we tried our best to either do virtually or just be mindful of the fact that when you can't bring more than 10 people in a room, that's gonna change some things with a class of 300 plus. 
Um, I'd like to give a special shout out. Um, we've worked collaboratively with the Kansas State Department of Education throughout this process. They invited all school districts to nominate one student representative to be considered on a panel of 60 seniors from the entire state of Kansas. And we put forward the name Cody Savage, which I know is not unknown to a number of people in this community. Very impressive family, all gone through Leavenworth High School. He was not only selected to be one of those 60 plus representatives on what is called the 2020 senior leaders conversation. He also, no surprise to anybody that's ever met or discussed anything with him, he kind of rose to an A-team level to where he was online with the State Board of Education just yesterday, briefing him along with just four or five other members of that committee. Um, the, that group specifically was engaged to help identify um, from the senior's perspective things that they need um, for closure or things that they need as they move on to either a military service, job, um, post-secondary success, all of those information and inputs are going into what the State Department of Education is rolling out, which will be guidance for the 2021 school year. We hope to have that mid-July. Uh, that will change and alter some of our planning or we'll be, we'll be ready to be flexible um, to what we get from that. But just wanted to thank Cody Savage for his willingness to participate on that very important statewide designation. Um, specific to graduation, we had planned what we called in-person graduation ceremonies. Um, which would be limited to whatever county health allowed us to, to bring together um, in terms of public gatherings. Typically when we have a graduation event, we have anywhere from 1,700 to 2,000 people on site, whether that be outside at Pioneer Stadium or inside spread between our two gyms. There's no known date for when that will be allowed to happen. Um, as a school district, we're also mindful that unlike some, um, we have a number that begin to leave us during the course of the summer months, specifically to military enlistments and relocations. So we did feel momentum and uh, the necessity to try to get something planned as close to what would have been the normal graduation as possible, which was originally scheduled for this Saturday, May 16th. Knowing we can't bring those groups together and having updated guidance from the governor's office at the end of last week, we have a tentative plan in place where we will bring in students on a one by one, one family in, one family basis, where we will record their graduation ceremony, their diploma distribution ceremony in our main gymnasium. We'll limit that group to the school principal and superintendent. We'll have six foot spacing throughout, lots of hand sanitizer opportunities to, to clean in between gatherings. Um, but over the course of two weeks, as soon as we get that green light that we're in phase two, we'll begin putting that, that package together. Seniors have already received that communication. They know it's coming, and we're super excited to see them in person and be able to help them recognize that milestone. Each of those interactions will be video recorded, and we will broadcast what we're calling a full virtual graduation package. Originally, we were planning on that June 6th. That may need to be postponed depending on when we're able to start bringing in seniors for those diploma ceremonies. So at some point at the end of this, we will have as best as we can put together in terms of a virtual graduation event that recognizes all of the traditions that you would have expected had you seen it in person prior to coronavirus conditions. All the senior speeches, all the keynotes, the musical performances, all those will be individually recorded in a safe manner and then broadcast both on our uh, Facebook Live and then also uh, our district YouTube channel. So we do know that our seniors are important. We absolutely have that plan in place. You might see other districts um, postponing everything until late July, early August. We didn't have any confidence that we weren't going to lose uh, members of our class. So this is the plan that we have in place and feel good about that. Other things that are happening during the course of the summer um, as you've driven around town, one of the silver linings from this shutdown has been the ability to move forward with some of our construction projects and activities specific to the bond update. So you're seeing lots of activity at Leavenworth High School, the Richard Warren Educational Campus, which is where we'll have the new fifth, sixth grade intermediate center. Um, and we've actually even been able to vacate Lawson earlier than expected, which a year from now will be the new kindergarten, pre-K, early education campus. So that helps in the overall time, time deadlines of when we're ready to be up and running. So fifth, sixth grade and intermediate will be ready for the start of next school year. As scheduled, the first day of school with all school students is August 17th. 
But what we are doing now, um, next week's conversations and throughout the summer, is really devising a plan to when we do bring students back, figuring out where they're at grade level wise, what gaps or deficiencies they have that really require intervention or strengthening to get them where they need to be. And we may be looking flexibly at the beginning of the start of next school year, which may mean that if we're able to, um, we might start bringing in students even sooner than the week of the 17th. That requires lots of conversations, um, lots of collaboration with all of our stakeholders. We know by then we'll have additional guidance from the State Department of Education in terms of attendance waivers, what we can and can't do, and of course, uh, be mindful of whatever our group gathering restrictions are at that time. So that is something that we're mindful of, and if there are any adjustments to the 2021 school calendar, we'll communicate those widely and broadly and hopefully have an opportunity to come back here, uh, brief the city, use all formats possible, because we're, we're sensitive to the fact that parents have had to pick up the slack in a totally different way than they're used to during the school year. Um, myself as a parent, I can tell you that I max out in terms of being able to help my kids with a fifth grade math level of around sixth grade. Um, and the more kids you have, the more grade levels they're in, the more schools they're in, uh, the more complex it is. So we're sensitive to that. We're excited and anxious to get them back safely as soon as we can. But that's also going to mean some adjustments. Um, depending on what gathering guidelines are like, uh, breakfasts and lunches may look different next year. School assemblies may look different. Back to school nights where we typically bring in all of our parents and groups may look different. So we'll be planning basically multiple scenarios, either that be a virtual distribution of information or staggered start times or grade level kind of in out in a controlled way. Again, that are mindful of what our, what our capacity limitations are. Um, so I didn't get too far in the weeds in the bond update. Happy to follow up on any questions specific to that. Um, one last thing I did want to highlight is the success of another thing that we had to deploy quickly was the ability of our child nutrition department to provide breakfast and lunch service in a new and different way. So we've made a couple of location adjustments since March 26th, but where we are now and where we plan to continue to be are 10.30 a.m. to noon offerings at Anthony Elementary and David Brewer Elementary and remote meal service, which means a bus comes to Woodland Village between 10.20 and 11 a.m. Monday through Fridays, and now with Lawson being offline with some construction activities, we've moved that location to the Richard Allen Cultural Center. That's an 11.10 a.m. to 11.50 a.m. offering. All those times, dates, and locations are available on our website, usd453.org, and those will continue until June 30. At that point in time, if we're to be able to extend, it will require authorization from the state of Kansas. And if we're able to do so, we'll go as long as we can into July at that point. Um, there is a reset period that takes place prior to the beginning of the school year. So there are some days and weeks where we're offline. That's consistent with what we would be under a traditional school year setting and offering. So um, I want to thank all of our, as I said, our families that have been so patient with us and um, probably gotten to see um, what education looks like even more <laughs> intimately you know, they did when they um, sometimes are limited to that parent-teacher conference update. Um, they've been a big, huge help and definitely helped us with some problem solving and suggestions along the way. Also, our teaching staff, they're not used to providing delivery of instruction in this way. Um, they've been awesome. And as I said, all of our classified certified employees who continue to report and continue to support being mindful of the fact that um, life does go on for our families and we're doing as much as we can as possible um, under unprecedented, or unprecedented circumstances. How about, uh, is there going to be a parade of cars at some point or um and i don't know if you touched on that but could you just briefly touch on that right absolutely so we had originally planned on that for this saturday may 16th at 10 30 a.m which was the original date and time of graduation ceremony we're hopeful that with additional guidance from the governor and department of health um, that that would be postponed as soon as possible under phase two tentatively we had that scheduled for may 23rd if and when we're able to move to phase two, which we understand no sooner than May 18th, which would be Monday. Again, quick turnaround, um, but we're mindful of the fact that each passing week we're going to lose more members of the senior class to the next phase of their life. So absolutely, 1030 a.m., it's a, a, a vehicle processional okay. honoring the class of 2020. It's scheduled to start from the Warren Middle School parking lot. 
proceed down Grand Avenue, or proceed down 10th, 10th Avenue. Yeah. Um, okay. Weather permitting, we'll have all of our staff on campus outside, space six foot apart, waving and saluting each of our seniors as they pass by. Um, seniors are welcome to decorate their car school appropriately for the event. <laughs> um, they're welcome to have their families in the vehicle with them because what we won't have is any kind of tailgate prior, right. before, or after. We're uh, encouraging everyone to stay in their vehicles for that. Um, but we're trying to be as creative as we can to provide so closure and nice. also let our seniors know how important they am. And it's been a struggle for not just the teachers at the high school, but at all levels who never got to have that last day goodbye with all of our, with all of our students. So mm -hmm. it's one thing that we have in plan. And as you, as you said, um, that's tentatively for Saturday, May 23rd. And hopefully it's a good weather day for that. Great. Are there any questions for? Um, I know that, um, and I, I think the, the parents of our uh, students in the district and uh, other, other people in the community have stepped up. I've noticed all the blue and white ribbons displayed around town, which is, mm -hmm. which is nice. I yep. uh, love the colors, the blue and white colors of Leavenworth High School. And so I'll, I'll just mention that and uh, thank and you for- That's a good plug for our high school yeah. PTA, right. um, the Leavenworth Public Schools Education Foundation, the city of Leavenworth, you're giving us love on the virtual virtual signage mm -hmm. uh, just, just to the north of Abel's Field. All of those um, can't say enough good things um, about, again, knowing that this class has missed out, but um, mm -hmm. you know, as we try to look for silver lines to be positive, no one will forget the class of 2020. Um, everyone will remember being a part of this time and era and anything that we can, can do to let them know how important um, their commitment to the last four years of high school success was um, is, is well received and definitely appreciated community-wide. Just one or two top line things in terms of insights and uh, kind of best practices that uh, maybe you've gleaned over the last uh, two months, two plus months as far as delivering instruction in this way. I mean, just some top line things. What, what, what comes to mind? I can be focused sometimes on the, on the challenges, but mm -hmm. I know right. the positives are um, especially with the ability of Zoom with a lot of our teachers to mm -hmm. classrooms. They've been able to see the homes of some of our students and been able to connect in a totally different way. Um, I think kids have been excited to see one another, um, even yeah. if online. So really yeah. doing what we can to build those relationships has been important. I think another top line has been if you would have told our staff, you know, August 17th that uh, a semester from now we're going to be totally remote, um, people mm -hmm. would have not believed that that right. would be possible. Um, when there are no other, you know, when, when failure is not an option, right. everyone can quickly come together to really move a ship in a pretty impressive way. So just the spirit of collaboration, um, willingness to be innovative, willingness mm -hmm. to try new things, all of those have been top line. Um, we are taking a deeper dive into our platform. So yeah. without specifics, our elementary was using one platform, Seesaw, yeah. secondary Google Classroom. Yeah. Um, the more, as I talked about earlier, the more students you have, the more schools you have, um, in your own household as you're trying to navigate that is we recognize complex. Um, it can be hard for a student to know what's assigned versus what's an update. Um, so being able to weed through that and make sure that they're staying on task. Um, so if there's things we can do to provide consistency and clarity from the school side, even district wide, those will be some of the opportunities for improvement that, that we're looking at for next year. Well, I just want to pass along on behalf of the entire city commission and the city manager and and his staff, thanks and appreciation to the staff and faculty of USD 453. All those things that you talked about, they've maintained, you know, a great positive attitude and they've really adapted. And uh, I know that's not easy, particularly doing it on the fly. So really appreciate all their professionalism and, uh, and uh, they're going to get, hopefully get some time off this summer and right. well-deserved. Absolutely. So just uh, extend my best to them uh, as they finish out the school year, which is unprecedented and uh, very unique in all respects, but really do appreciate all their professionalism. And with respect to the class of 2020, if you would pass along our congratulations and kudos from the mayor and the city commission, the city manager and his staff on their graduation. Uh, it's a year they'll never forget. They'll be talking to their kids, and I think they'll be talking to their kids and grandkids about it, you know, uh, 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now. But they've, they've adapted, too, and um, nobody wanted that to happen. It was uh, unforeseen, but I think they've, I know that they've adapted very, very well, and uh, I appreciate you having a sense of urgency, Dr. Roth and his whole team, whole team as far as trying to Yes, closing out the year with a good graduation and realizing that m many of the students in a month, month and a half will, will be off to other things th with the type of community that we have yes, with sir. the military and, and uh, military families moving, uh, 
people, if they're not going to college, maybe going into the military service and those type of things. So um, any, any questions from the, from the audience? Um, well, I really appreciate you coming, Mr. Potter, and uh, a good rundown. And if there's uh, anything we can do over the, well, at any time, but particularly in the next couple of weeks, uh, let us know. And I really do appreciate my best to Dr. Roth and the staff. And I know you guys have been very, very busy and uh, putting good plans in, 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 in place and then having to adjust as, uh, as they're executed. Thank you. Appreciate the time. Thank you for coming and have a good rest of your day. All right, will do. Okay. <clears throat> um, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about the current status of the Governor Kelly's order. We are currently in phase one of Governor Kelly's Ad Astra, a plan to reopen Kansas. At this time, no determination has been made as to when phase two of that plan will start. But we know phase two will not occur any earlier than May 18th, which is uh, next Monday. So we'll just have to, you know, uh, hang loose, see what comes down. I, I think there'll be some executive order. It may be saying for the state and the counties and the cities to continue with phase one, or it may be transitioning to phase two or phase two modified. We'll see what happens, but uh, we've got to remain flexible. I would think that there would be something coming out later this week, but I have no inside information, but nothing's come out yet as far as I know. City services. The city is in the third week of modified service levels at the Recycle Center and Brush Site. In the first two weeks, 636 cars went through the Recycling Center and 288 cars went through the brush site. Starting next week, the week of March 18th, May 18th, May 18th, excuse me, both the recycling center and brush site will return to normal hours. Since our last town hall meeting, the Wagging Tails Dog Park has reopened and the riverfront campground is open on a limited basis for those campers that have self-contained plumbing including their own bathroom facilities for obvious reasons. Um, that, is, that is the case, and that is the one big uh, caveat with respect to the, the campground. Plus, I think they're probably deployed like every other like camp, campsite. Right, yeah, a lot of spacing. Okay. Um, for the first time, I can announce today that Woolman Park Aquatic Center will not open on May 25th, which would mark the traditional Memorial Day opening for the city pool. No decision has been made to close the pool for the entire summer, and staff will continue to monitor public health and public safety considerations to determine if the pool will be able to open later this summer. Trends throughout the Kansas City area in cities such as Bonner Springs, Roland Park, Prairie Village, and Atchison, to name a few, uh, have, have, they have decided to uh, close the pools for the entire summer for the entire summer season. But we do not need to make that decision at this time. We'll continue to evaluate it and uh, keep our citizens and the public informed. Any further openings of city facilities or city buildings are on hold at this time. And I think this is a good time just to turn it over quickly to the city manager to cover a, a few things. Mr. Kramer. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just a couple other notes for the city. Uh, again, just to reiterate, if anybody hasn't heard, trash bag delivery continues to be uh, of interest to our citizenry. We understand that. Um, become accustomed to receiving those trash bags. That's going to be done in a two-phase uh, si uh, system starting May 30th uh, on that Saturday and then June 6th, which is a Saturday, uh, roughly half the city each of those two Saturdays to complete that trash bag delivery. Um, going back to the city facilities and buildings on hold at this time, a lot of that is, is determined, as the mayor said, as Mayor Griswold said, on when the state transitions to different levels of phasing. That's also, we also take into account um, the county health department. Uh, we are in constant communication with Jamie Miller, the uh, Leavenworth County Health Public Health Officer, as well as uh, our police and fire department, um, and trying to make the best decision for the visitors and for the employees of the city. Uh, the city is hiring. I'll, I'll continue to make the plug each week for some city job openings. We have openings at our wastewater treatment plant. Um, uh, the city prosecutor position is open that functions at municipal court. Uh, we are always hiring uh, police officers. Um, we do have, uh, for the first time uh, in quite a while, a few fire department openings. So firefighters uh, for the city of Leavenworth, we have some openings there. 
Um, we are, we've moved to some, a little bit of modified hiring practices with uh, fire, uh, firefighting specifically and some other jobs where some of the certification programs that we require, they aren't operating right now because of the coronavirus. So if you have applied in the past or thinking about applying and you may be short, um, one or two of the required uh, classes we have or the certifications we have, uh, check back with us because we may have made some modifications um, to try to accommodate uh, some of those who haven't been able to get those certifications. We're also still hiring our solid waste collectors, um, critical to city functions, uh, and those positions are, are constantly uh, hiring. Going back to the Woman Aquatic Center, just briefly, um, we, were, we are able to push off that decision because we have such a strong stable of lifeguards who have been with us in the past and we've reached out to them to say, if we open later in the year, would you be um, open? At some point, they won't be, so at some point, we'll have to make a decision, but right now, we do have the staff in place, and we're able to do that if, at some point, we're able to open. Um, and again, uh, everything else is sort of on hold at this point, and uh, we'll update you as we know more. Thank you, Mr. Kramer. I got a little ahead of myself. Normally, what I do after our guest expert um, speaks and uh, fields questions is that I go over the stats in a summary form at the state level for the COVID-19 and also at the county level. I'll, I'll go ahead and do that, probably an abbreviated version uh, today. But um, so at the state level at Kansas, and, and by the way, they they're, this is at on the uh, Kansas Department of Health and Environment. It's on their website, the COVID-19 uh, page, information page. But I guess they're updating their map now uh, just three, three times a week on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays by 12.30 p.m. each of those days. Before, you know, uh, they were doing it daily, but uh, three times a week um, now. Uh, so what I'm talking about here as far as stats were last updated on Monday, uh, the May 11th at 9 a.m. And as we're talking, that I would assume that if they haven't updated it, for today, Wednesday the 13th, they're going to do it very, very soon. But the number of total cases within the uh, state is uh, now 7,116. Hospitalizations are 660. Statewide deaths are 158. And um, the total case rate uh, per 1,000 people within the state is 2.44%. Uh, so. That's, you know, a per capita case rate, 2.44%, you know, based on 1,000 people. Um, and Leavenworth County uh, total case rate is 11.5%, which is obviously higher in terms of a per 1,000 people um, case rate. And that is fourth highest in the state. And I think it's primarily because of the Lansing Correctional F Facility in terms of their, in terms of the numbers over the last uh, four or five weeks with respect to the inmates and, unfor and unfortunately for both inmates and, and staff. So that is a rather large, uh, high percentage, but uh, we believe it, we know what it's primarily uh, due to. Um, the number of, um, actually the number of males who have, tested positive is, is higher. It's about 55% at the state level. Females is about 41% and not reported is at almost 3%. Um, in terms of uh, cases, um, the most cases have been in the age group of 35 through 44. That's no change from what I reported last week, almost 20% of the total. And then the next age group, the next highest is 25 through 34 years of age and that's about 19%. Uh, and the average age of a person who is tested uh, positive is 44 years old, and the oldest is um, uh, 100 years old, and the youngest is a baby, uh, not, even, not yet one year old. The deaths, as I mentioned, are 158 at the state level. Median age for, median age for the people who have passed away is 82. The youngest person has been 36 years old and the oldest 99 years old. Um, and that's a 2.2% uh, death rate at the um, state level. And that's compared nationally to about 5.9% uh, uh, death rate at the national level. So um, just a little comparison uh, in terms of uh, 
death rates. Um, and the deaths by age group, and I said this last week, it hasn't changed, 85 plus years uh, represents about 65 of the, the deaths, which is about 48%. And then next is the age group, 75 to 84 years, 35 deaths. That represents about 22%. And then the third highest age group of deaths is 65 years through 74 years, about 29, which represents 16.5%. But that just goes along with what we've known as far as the age of people being a factor in terms of the comorbidities, those other things like um, heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, those type of things you know, complicate the uh, situation for people in those age groups who contract the virus. You know, um, the people, uh, in terms of the uh, testing rate uh, for people, there's been in the state uh, a little over 54,000 people tested, and based on a, a thousand, you know, a thousand a population, a per capita testing rate is 18.5% for the state. Uh, that compares to a 45.8% uh, testing rate for Leavenworth County, which is the, you know, per 1,000 people, once again, a per capita rate, uh, a little over almost 46%, which represents the sixth highest in the state. Uh, so it means we're doing, I think Leavenworth County is doing well as far as testing. It's been necessary and we've had, you know, that outbreak at the Lansing Correctional Facility. So those are contributing factors to that fairly high test rate. But this test, the high test rate to me is, is a good thing. And uh, just kind of trying to give you a perspective on Leavenworth County versus the other counties and Leavenworth County compared to the, compared to the state. And so Leavenworth County, as of yesterday, the 12th of May at 4 p.m., there were uh, confirmed positive people who have tested 158 community cases within the county, and then um, 738 inmates at uh, Lansing Correctional Facility. And any of the staff at Len Lansing Correctional Facility would be included in that 158 community cases. And then at the Grossman Center, which is a halfway house that's run by the United um, Bureau of Prisons here in Leavenworth, they've unfortunately over the last few days uh, had an outbreak there. And there's 42 of the people in the Grossman Center that have been tested and have been tested positive for COVID-19. So that's really the, probably the newest development since I talked to you a week ago at, at the last uh, Facebook Live uh, town hall that's uh, impacting Leavenworth County. The number of deaths is still six. I believe it was six when I talked to uh, the citizens a week ago. Um, I have noticed that in terms of the community cases uh, over the course of the last week or so, uh, the numbers are, you know, low one, you know, one a day, zero a day, one a day, zero a day. So that that's a good sign um, that those cases are in those low numbers there. And Hopefully the county will be able to, and, and our citizens will be able to keep that up. Um, that's, that's encouraging uh, because when we first, you know, began this uh, month or month and a half ago, you know, the numbers got up in terms of uh, any particular day, 10, 6, 7, 10. So these current numbers in terms of the community cases, people who have tested positive is, uh, has been lowered and it seems like it's, staying pretty low with the exception of what happened recently at the uh, at the Grossman Center and 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 some continued uh, inmates and a smaller number of staff at Lansing Correctional Facility who have tested positive. I'm going to transition now to um, uh, and I mentioned this last night at the end of our uh, weekly City Commission meeting talk a little bit about the census the 2020 census which is a very important uh, civic responsibility for all citizens, just as important um, as, uh, in my estimation, in my judgment, as voting is, particularly in, during a presidential year. But the United States does a census every 10 years, so it's 2020, and we're in the midst of that right now. I want to talk a little bit about the current self-response rates as of Monday, the 11th of May. At the national level, the response rate thus far has been 58.7%. 
Kansas has a 63.2% response rate. Leavenworth County has a 66.8% um, res response rate and so ranks in the top 10 in the state for counties, and that's very, very good. And the city of Leavenworth is almost 60%, 59.8% response rate. Um, just as a point of review, in March 2020, notices went out to Leavenworth residents asking them to complete the census online. We want to encourage everyone to respond to the census by using the census ID they would have received in that notice. Our local field office says all notices were sent out in the city of Leavenworth. If you have lost that number, you can respond online or phone without an ID. There are three ways to respond, online, by phone, or by mail. Online, you can Google uh, 2020census.gov. Again, 2020census.gov. The phone is one 844 330 1-844-330-2020. The mail, you could return the form you received to the United States Census Bureau National Processing Center, 100 Logistics Avenue, Jeffersonville, Indiana, 47414. The deadline for responding to the U.S. Census has been extended to October 31st, so that's, that's a good thing. We still have time, but... Um, if, if you can do it online, it really does not take long. Uh, I know everyone can't do that because not everyone has access to the internet and or a computer, but uh, I did that about a month, maybe five weeks ago, and it really did not take long at all. Pretty, pretty easy, very well-designed website, and um, that's what I would encourage people to do, but there are other ways to do it, as I've just mentioned. Additionally, the U.S. Census is looking to hire and restart its field operations. Check out uh, www.2020census.gov slash jobs to apply or check the status of your job application if you applied before the pandemic. And just uh, this is why the census is so important. An undercount of the U.S. Census affects how Leavenworth receives funding for low-income housing, low-income housing vouchers, Money for road construction, new health care facilities, school buildings, supplemental nutrition assistance program, SNAP, Medicaid, community development block grant programs, and more. Census officials estimate an undercount could cost Leavenworth approximately $54,000 in program funding for its citizens over a 10-year period. And I believe that's that's a 53,000 per, 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 per citizen, yeah. per citizen. And I think I probably said that wrong last night, but yes, it's per citizen, which is, which is, a, which is a lot of money. Um, so it is a very, very important civic responsibility to do this. We need to know how many people live in our nation, how many li people live in our state, our county, and in the city of Leavenworth. So um, if you have any questions about that, send them in. And uh, if not during the Facebook uh, live, you could, send them in to, to the city and we'll, we'll answer the question. But I tried to be pretty thorough as far as going over that. The uh, next thing that I wanted to talk about is jobs and the city manager mentioned the job openings here within the city. Uh, last night, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Bowder talked a little bit about this. Uh, she's the uh, executive director of Leavenworth County United Way, but she and um, uh, Ms. Marsha Irvine, who's the director of the Leavenworth Pioneer Career Center, which is part of the Kansas City, Kansas uh, Community College. Their campus is uh, on Spruce Street down near the intersection of Spruce and 20th. It's in the old uh, West Middle School. But uh, this is really one of the um, uh, great assets that the city of Leavenworth has had for many years, several years. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the programs that they have available for people to uh, get education, get the training, get the certifications that they might need uh, going forward. And I, I think one of the reasons this is important is that people now, some, you know, the people are not working. The unemployment rate is very high. and. If people have the time and want to maybe 
do something a little bit different or get even more qualified in the fields that they currently work in, the uh, Leavenworth Pioneer Career Center, part of Kansas City, Kansas Community College here within our city has a lot of great programs. And I'm just gonna kind of review a little bit of what Ms. Irvine sent to uh, Mayor Pro Tem uh, Bowder and I was CC'd on the email, so I'm happy to share the information. Um, Ms. Irvine wanted to remind us that Kansas City, Kansas Community College is doing a lot here within Leavenworth County at the Pioneer Career Center. In addition to the traditional college classes the, the Pioneer Center offers, they also have six programs that students can be certified in a year or less be certified in in a year or less and be able to get a job or increase their opportunities for a career. The programs are certified nursing assistant, CNA, one semester, must pass state certification test. Certified medication aid, CMA, one semester, must be CNA certified, must pass state certification test. Construction, one year. Three certifications total, or one certification per semester, and that would end up in being a Kansas City, Kansas Community College certificate. Culinary, two semesters, once again a Kansas City, Kansas Community College certificate. Electrical technology, one year uh, curriculum for Kansas City, Kansas Community College certificate. And then heating, ventilation, and cooling, which is HVAC, uh, one year, which would result in a Kansas City, Kansas Community College certificate. And depending on a student's household income, much of the cost can be covered by financial aid and or scholarships. VA benefits can also be utilized. And we just want to encourage our constituents, our citizens, to take advantage of these opportunities right here in Leavenworth. Any questions can be directed to the Director of the Leavenworth Pioneer Career Center, Ms. Marsha Irvine, at M. Irvine, which is M I R V I N E, at kckcc.edu, or by calling her office at 913 288 7751, or the main number at 913 288 7750. So um, I think. That's very, very good information, and quite frankly, some people may have that opportunity now because they're not, they're not, their 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 job went away. Hopefully, just for a temporary period of time. But if they have the time, and I do think many of our citizens do have that time, if they want to get even more credentialed, more qualifications in their particular field, or they maybe want to change something going forward, and they need the training and education and certification, the Pioneer Career Center right here within the city of Leavenworth is a is a great option. Now also, we'll talk, uh, you know, the University of Kansas has had a campus in Leavenworth at the, uh, I think it's the... Um, Fairfield Inn. The, the Fairfield Inn is where they've been, had a campus. I am sure that they are not meeting, um, you know, uh, as they normally have there, but I'm sure that they've continued their courses online. Um, Taylor tells me it's the Town Place Suites. Oh, the Town, Town Place Suites, and that's where, their, that's where their classes have been held, but I'm pretty sure that... They've gone pretty much to distance learning over the course of the last couple of months because I know KU has done that uh, overall as an entire university. But I mention that because those courses are still available, um, obviously not for this semester, but going into the, you know, the summer or the fall semester, I know those courses would be available. So I encourage uh, citizens who may have an interest in the course offerings to go online, University of Kansas, look at the Leavenworth campus and see what's available. And I do know that uh, they've had a, not here, but KU overall at Edwards campus, I believe. Yes, Edwards campus, although now I think the classes are being done online, has a, it's called an information technology boot camp. And they have about three courses. I know two of them. One's for coding, one's for website design, and I can't remember the other one, but it's a, uh, I believe it's six or seven months, very intensive, but very, um, very, very good course to get people the training that they need in those areas, get them certified, and become very marketable, as far as I know, out in the you know, information technology 
sector where there are, you know, base, there are a lot of opportunities, job opportunities. So I just mentioned that that's not something offered here at the Leavenworth campus, but it is something the University of Kansas offers overall. And that may be another thing for people who are, you know, not working now and have some time, you may want to want to look into that. If you have any questions, you can uh, contact me, send me an email. I do know a little bit about that. I know the provost who's in charge of the uh, vice provost who's in charge of the campus here. Um, and uh, also in charge of, overall in charge of that IT boot camp program that I just spoke about. Um, the other thing I'll say is that um, part of the Rotary Club here within Lansing and Leavenworth, and we went out, socially distanced ourselves on Saturday to go ahead and uh, clean up uh, 10th Avenue Park. That's a park that we've covered down, the Rotary Club has covered down on for just a, a real long time. And so we were able to get out there. Actually, things didn't seem too bad um, as far as the litter and, and trash that we had to pick up. But I mentioned that, uh, that we were able to maintain the social distance and, and get that work done. I know there's other organizations that sponsor parks uh, within the city. And uh, if, if you can do that safely, maintaining social distancing, I'd ask you to consider that and maybe set something up um, just so we, we didn't have our spring cleanup as we normally do. So I think this will be a need going forward. And then we'll see maybe in the fall we could have a fall cleanup. We don't know. We'll, we'll see as we get closer. But um, it's very important, at least to me and the, the rest of the commissioners and the city manager and the staff, that we keep the appearance and image of Leavenworth at the highest possible level. And uh, I know it's difficult during these times when we're, you know, restricted in terms of, uh, somewhat restricted in terms of our movement. But if you do that, make sure you're, in addition to maintaining the social distancing and hopefully wearing masks, although it's not a mandatory, it's not our mandate, it's strongly encouraged that people uh, do that within our community. Um, and that, uh, that people are safe if they're going ahead and, and gonna pick up litter you have to maintain safety. That, that's very, very important. And um, the only other thing I would say is that, and I think our businesses do a pretty good job, is just look at your, look at your areas there in your parking lots and things like that. And uh, just, you know, what you can do as far as um, getting, you know, getting that uh, litter picked up would be much appreciated and would contribute to the appearance and image of our city. So that's kind of the last thing I think I wanted to talk about. Um, any questions? No questions today, okay. Uh, people aren't. Um, so we continue um, with the city's response to the COVID-19 health crisis. And uh, once again, our mission and our overriding priority is to uh, do our very best to ensure the health, safety, and welfare of all our citizens. And in focusing on this um, priority, um, we've been, I've been focused, and the city manager and his staff have been focused on sharing pertinent accurate information relating to COVID-19, adjusting the delivery of city services to account for the social distancing requirements stipulated by the County Health Department, and as much as possible advocating for small businesses and, and getting the word out along with Leavenworth Main Street and the Leavenworth County Development Corporation on the programs that are available. I'm not gonna go into much detail today. I, I do have a few calls in to some of our bankers within, in, within the town because I'm trying to find out generally how the, how the response was and how our businesses, small businesses made out in the second iteration of funding that came out about two weeks ago on the Paycheck Protection Program and we haven't had a chance to connect yet. I know that uh, Mr. Steve Jack, who's the Executive Director of the Leavenworth County Development Corporation, when he talked to the City Commission a week ago yesterday, mentioned that he had talked to some bankers and they thought that not only the first um, iteration, but for those businesses that had their applications in and were just waiting for additional money that, that things went after a few uh, glitches and some information technology challenges during the first couple of days of when the money was released uh, by the federal government and by the Small Business Administration that uh, things generally went pretty well. Now, I know that there's probably some exceptions. I know in that second tranche of money and that second uh, CARES bill that came down, they tried to make it easier on small businesses, particularly small businesses that did not have a relationship with a, with a bank. 
Um, and there, was, there are other organizations that help small businesses that aren't banks, um, but hopefully that was the case. I'll probably find out from our, some of our bankers here over the next few days, and hopefully I can share that information with you on a general basis a week from today. But um, just uh, continue to uh, be healthy, remain home when you can, when you go out. Uh, once again, it's not mandatory, but I encourage people to wear uh, masks, particularly if you're indoors in a, in a uh, business, uh, whether it's a small business or a, uh, you know, a large uh, box store. Um, I know that the restaurants in phase one were permitted, I believe, under phase one, the Governor Kelly's plan to reopen, you know, the indoor dining areas, but under very strict stipulations that not only came down from the governor, but also their trade associations or their, you know, the associations, their industries kind of setting those standards. I know that some of our restaurants have reopened for inside dining. Some have chosen not to yet. I believe almost all of them are still offering, you know, delivery, uh, curbside pickup. So continue to, uh, you know, uh, be, uh, pay, be patrons to our restaurants um, uh, and because they're doing their very, very best to continue um, doing a great job for our community as far as offering meals and uh, delivering uh, first class service and having to do a lot more to ensure that's done in a safe and um, in a healthy manner. Um, so I don't think there's anything else, Mr. Kramer, anything else? No. So without further ado, I hope everyone has a good rest of their Wednesday and rest of their week. And we look forward to talking to you next Wednesday again at 11 a.m. Thank you very much.